Let's pray as we come to God's word this morning. Father, we do want to thank you today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you that you didn't leave us in our sin, but you brought redemption. Lord, we ask as we come to your word this morning, make it real to us. Let it change us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I, I don't know whether my uh, sermon ever got loaded or not. Okay. Uh, we had some computer difficulties, so my, uh, my message actually didn't get loaded up into the program. But I'd like to share with you this morning, the message is titled, She Took and Ate. And it's from Genesis chapter 3, which contains, among other things, the first promise of a savior that was there in the scripture. So Genesis chapter three, and uh, initially reading from verses one through five, there'll be some other references as well too. But the scripture says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Crafty in Hebrew is a neutral word. It doesn't necessarily mean evil. People can be skilled, and that's sort of what it means. In this case, the devil was skilled at bringing deception into the life of Eve and ultimately into the entire human race. But the serpent was crafty more than any beast of the field which the Lord has made. Said to the woman, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Most of us know this story. God had given them one command to follow. They were there in a perfect situation, a beautiful garden, and things were going well. They had one command, don't eat the fruit of one particular tree. And I like to think of it as, if you've ever been shopping for food in the Strip District, it's a great place. And it'd be like the mayor giving you the key to the city and saying, anytime you want, Pick anything you want, any time at all. But if you ever eat the Brussels sprouts, the whole thing's off. It's not hard. It's not hard to keep. So the enemy comes and says, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Uh, he initially just raises a question. He, he plants in her a possibility that God's holding something back from her. As God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. He's planning just a suspicion. He's not contradicting anything God said at this point. He's just raising a question. He's expressing a little skepticism. Has God actually said you can't eat from any tree? And uh, you know, that's followed by an exaggeration. Of course he hadn't said they can't eat from any tree. But it's to raise a question about God, to paint him in a negative way. Supposing Eve had said, are you out of your little head? This is Eden. And I'm a perfect wife and I have a perfect husband and we walk with God Perfectly. What's wrong with you? But she didn't say that. The woman said, verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, 
lest you will die. So she's showing a little frustration. God had never said they couldn't touch it. He just said, don't eat from it. She's getting frustrated. You know, maybe God is holding back. So she corrects his exaggeration, but she's got this little frustration that she's going on. Maybe a little frustration that maybe this God who has given me existence deep down is the kind of being that is holding something back from me. The serpent, verse four, said to the woman, oh good, thank you, whoever did that. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. She, he's calling God a liar. Not only is God a killjoy, he's trying to hold something back from you that is good, but he's a liar. You will not surely die. Do you know the first truth that was cast aside by our founding forefather and mother was the truth of God's judgment. See, if you can remove the idea that you will stand in judgment before God for your life, it gives you the freedom in your thoughts to do all kinds of things. God had said, in the day that you sin, you will die. It was his judgment. And there's a lot of people today who've cast aside any kind of an idea that God is a God who will bring judgment, that one day we will stand before him, one day we will give an account for the way we have lived our lives, one day we will give an account for the choices that we have made. So the enemy comes and he says, there's no consequences to this. You are not going to die. You know, the enemy likes to lie to people. And I think there's a whole lot of people on the earth today who live in a deception that there's no consequences, that God didn't mean what he said, that we would stand before him in judgment for our lives. But we will. So he gets this... He's trying to bring them into the deception that he himself is a part of the evil one. You will not die. God says you will, but you won't. There's so many people. You can go ahead and sin. Sin has no consequences. For the first time, Satan introduces a flat-out contradiction of what God had said. And the first doctrine to be denied is the doctrine of judgment. If you want to escape the authority of God in Scripture, you begin by denying that there's any judgment because then it's safe to rebel against him. You know, emphasize that he's a God of love, but forget that his holy perfection demands that there will be an answer. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, they were innocent to this point. God knows about evil not because he has personally involved himself in it, because he hasn't. He knows about evil in the same kind of a way that a surgeon knows about cancer. He understands everything there is about evil. He has never committed evil. He never will commit evil. But he understands evil like a surgeon understands what cancer is. Adam and Eve we're going to understand about evil in a different way, not by just intellectually understanding it. They're they're going to become evil. They're going to enter into becoming evil. And so that's how they learn the difference between good and evil, not in the same way that God did at all. Their temptation 
was an invitation to engage in rebellion against the loving God who created them, placed them in this beautiful setting, said there's only one restriction, and the enemy came and tempted them. Prior to that, their delight was in God. He was their unifying center. But now, make yourself like God. You shall be like God, is what the enemy, the devil said to them. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that whole idea is that my life is about what I want. I'm going to be the one who sets my goals for my life. And if somebody has something that I want, I'm entitled to just take it. Stealing. I deserve to be happy. So if that means I get on drugs, so, so be it. I can be like God. Well, what a lie. But there's an echo of that in the Old Testament. Satan himself was cast out of heaven on that same premise. But you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne, Isaiah chapter 14. Above the stars of God, I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses. Nevertheless, I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook nations? See, the devil was presenting his own shortcoming to Eve. He wanted to be like God. He was cast out of heaven. He comes to Eve and he says, you can be like God. Well, he knew very well a couple of things. He knew that they would never be like God. But they bought into this deception, knowing good and evil. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. He's telling them, there will be no judgment if you disobey. You're not going to die. God said you're going to die. You're not going to die. There's not going to be any consequences. There's not going to be any judgment that comes upon your life if you disobey God. Well, he already knew that he'd been judged. I mean, this was a 100% a lie, a deception. Second Peter chapter two, verse four, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Matthew 25, 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil knew very well that there's a day of judgment coming. In fact, when Jesus cast the legion of demons out of the two men in the tombs, what did they say to him? Have you come to torment us before the time? They, even the devil knows there's going to be a day of judgment. But he comes to people, go ahead and sin. Make yourself happy. Do whatever you want. There's no, God said there's consequences, but throw that right out the window. There's no consequences. You just be in charge of your life. The inference is that God's truth is subject to our judgment. That's a scary thought. And there are people today who know exactly what the Bible says, and they say, I don't care what the Bible says. I I, I don't want it to be like that. God has changed from those days. He has not changed. He says, you change. 
God's truth is not subject to our judgment. It raises the possibility that we have the right to stand in judgment of what God says, to express our dislike of what he says, to be the arbitrators as to the truth of his speech. Romans chapter 1, 32 Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. We live in a day like that in a lot of, a lot of ways. We live in a day like that. People know what the Bible says. We don't care anymore. You know, it's subject to our judgment. We're gonna live the way we want regardless of what God says or thinks, and there'll be no consequences. Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, and here's where we get our title, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. She followed her impressions rather than her instructions. It was pleasing. She took and ate, and he ate. It was a catastrophic failure that had catastrophic consequences. And we still reap the consequences today of the fall of mankind into sin. Uh, th this was a single act that changed the nature of people from being innocent to being self-seeking. And that self-seeking has brought about deception, oppression, death, sin of every kind, self-seeking in ways that displease God. It's the fountainhead of every human sin. It's in fact uh, the heart of covetousness, wanting something forbidden under the simple guise, I need it to make me happy. So simple the act, so hard the undoing. And there's no going back to innocence for Adam and Eve. Their eyes were open, they knew they were naked, sewed together fig leaves for covering. Laden with symbols. But it does show this. At one point they had nothing to hide. But now they did. And they hid from God or they tried to hide from God. Of course, you can't. And in that context, the first promise of a savior, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. God went on to make garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothe them. on the day that they sinned, and, and this is a hint of the salvation that would come as well. This was a hint of the beginning of the sacrificial system that Israel would have to come before God presenting the blood of animals. God had said, the day that you sin, you will die, but an animal took their place, actually, and the skin of that was given to them as a covering for their lives. And we know that this is Jesus, the seed of the woman, born of a virgin. He will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. I've said many times, there's not a lot of ways you can bruise your heel. Danny, have you ever been working on a car and a part fell off and hit you on the heel? You've been doing it long enough, you might have. <laughs> but not your heel, in all likelihood. Yeah, there's not a lot of ways to bruise your heel. 
But one guaranteed way is crucifixion. And as Jesus comes down to crush the serpent's head, the serpent's, the, the sack of poison is in the head of a serpent. He's coming down to crush the enemy. And as he does, the serpent puts his fangs in his heel and he's crucified. You have to push off the cross with your bones out of joint to breathe. But you can't stay up long because your bones are out of joint. And Jesus' heel was literally bruised as he came and hit the enemy right in the center of where he spreads his poison. See, God had said, if you eat the fruit, you shall die. In his mercy, he promised a savior and began an idea that another could take their place in the judgment. Genesis 5, 3, when Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. Well, his image was fallen. You know, the seed of the woman was born, Jesus was born of a virgin. And it's just such an amazing story Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, take and eat were the verbs of sin and death. She took the food. She listened to the enemy. She took it. She ate. Take and eat were the words that ushered in misery, sin, Harm, hell, all these things. But you know, those words were given in a different context as well. Take and eat become the verbs of salvation. When Jesus at the Last Supper took the bread and broke it, And he gave it to them and said, take ye all of this and eat. For this is the new covenant in my blood. You know, the same words, take and eat. She took and eat and it brought in misery. It brought in sin. Jesus says he's getting ready to go to the cross. He he distributes the elements of the Passover to them. And he says to them, Take and eat. And that sacrifice that Jesus gave ushered in such amazing blessings and amazing benefits to everyone who would believe. And it's escape from the judgment that we will stand before the Lord for in our lives. Pardon for our sin. Forgiveness for all the wrongs that we have committed. He's like, The enemy's like, take and eat. I'm gonna bring this misery into your life. Jesus is distributing the elements of the Passover meal and he's saying, take and eat because I'm going to bring into your life restoration, forgiveness, restitution. I'm gonna bring into your life eternal life. Take and eat. What a Lord. Romans 5, 8, God just demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 5, 12 says this, therefore just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all had sinned. 
The free gift is not like the transgression, speaking of Adam and Eve's sin. If by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of God by the one man, Jesus, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, Adam and Eve. For on the one hand, judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation. On the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He came to be our Savior. Not only our Savior, he came to be our Lord. The first Adam was a disobedient son. The last Adam was an obedient son. And I'm just gonna contrast in Romans 5 the differences. This, this is what it says about Adam and take and eat in terms of the original sinful act. Because of that, death entered the world, death through sin, death spread to all men, death reigned. By the transgression of the one, the many died. A judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. Through one man's disobedience, so many were made sinners. And this is what it says about Christ. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. On the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Take and eat. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Wow. Have you received the abundance of grace? Have you taken and eaten? Have you accepted what he did as your justification? Because of Adam and our participation ourselves and willingly in sin, before Christ, we're under the, the domination of the evil one. But in Christ, we reign in life. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. Through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. As sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. God's given the answer and that's why we celebrate Christmas. I was actually kind of encouraged this week. I, I went to see uh, a doctor, and as we're talking, he asked me, well, what's new in your life? You know, what's going on? I said, I'm still pastoring, and I said, he said, you busy? I said, yeah, Christmas gets pretty busy. And he said, you know, I was driving down the highway, and I saw a sign, and it made a lot of sense to me. So the sign said, Jesus is the reason for the season. And he's looking at me. He's like witnessing to me. <laughs> I don't even know if he was saved, you know, but he's like witnessing to me. Yeah, Christmas isn't really about all this other stuff, you know. Christmas, the reason for the season is Jesus. And I'm there going, wow. <laughs> he is the reason for the season. And even though literally he almost certainly was not born on the day we celebrate his birth, it's still great to celebrate his birth. It's still great to re-recognize we would be so lost without him. 
and all that the enemy brought through his take and eat. Jesus comes and he's ready to go to the cross and he's giving his take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. Now the salvation is not in the elements. The salvation is in what the elements represent, which is his death and his resurrection, the way that he was crucified and he bore on our behalf the punishment for our sins. That I could go free, that you could go free. I've got a friend who, who puts it like this. Let's say you've been a, convicted of a crime that you are 100% guilty for, and the penalty for that crime is death. And you stand before the judge, and you know you're guilty, and the judge is ready to pass sentence. And the judge looks at you and says, you have been found guilty of this crime, but I am going to take your place and die for you. What? <laughs> Why would you do that? Love? Mercy? Desire to get rid of the devil's take and eat and give you my take and eat, eternal life freedom from sin, forgiveness for your sinfulness. I mean, who in their right mind would say no to that? And who in their right mind would say no to Jesus for what he has done? You know, this is his take and eat. Take and eat, this is my body. Again, it's not the elements themselves. It's what they represent. This represents my body, which is crucified, mangled for you, taking the judgment that you deserve. This is my blood, which has been shed for you. Have you received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness? I'm gonna ask Ed to make his way back up. I'd just like for us all to close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you're here today and you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, and you would like to this morning, I'd like you to raise your hand and be very happy to pray with anyone here today, saying, Pastor Dan, this is my day to give my life to Jesus. No one's hand is raised, but I'm still gonna lead us in a prayer. Dear Lord God, please pray along with me. I just want to thank you for your take and eat. The benefit of your death, the benefit of your resurrection at times in my life, I have listened to the devil's take and eat, and I've brought sin upon myself and upon other people. Forgive me, Lord. I have sat in judgment upon your word and acted like there are no consequences to the things you say there are consequences to, and I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I've imagined myself a judge over your truth and I've judged wrongly and forgive me, Lord. I want to give everything to you this morning. You're my God. You're the one who saved me. Lord, I want to receive that abundance of grace today. And I pray that you will Give me the wisdom and the strength to no longer live for myself, but to value and treasure what your word says, that I might please you and live for you in your blessing. Lord, I just want to thank you 
that you did this for me. And today, I receive that gift. I surrender my life to you. Let your Holy Spirit fill my life in a new, fresh way. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the love that brought Jesus to this world. You looked beyond our fault and you saw our need. You saw that each and every one of us had listened to the enemies take and eat. And you were born to offer your take and eat. Life, healing, love, meaning, contentment, fulfillment, eternal life, heaven. Lord, thank you for all of your goodness. I surrender myself to you gladly in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.